My name is Palmer Lucky. I'm the founder of Oculus and the designer of the Rift, a virtual reality headset that makes it feel like you're actually inside of the game. I think that my first console that I actually owned to myself was a Game Boy Pocket, and that thing was a you know, pretty sweet rig back in the day. I, I played a lot of Game Boy games, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Super Nintendo, played, spent a ton of time on the Nintendo 64. I've had pretty much every console that there's been, so it's hard to pick out one in particular as my favorite. I'm mostly a PC gamer these days, but let's see, favorite console, favorite console. Actually, probably my favorite console, oddly enough, it's this Korean open source Linux-based game console called the Open Pandora, and that thing's really nifty. I mean, when it first came out, there was nothing on the market like it. It has a keyboard, dual analog sticks, buttons, triggers, touch screen, uh, shell design and it runs Linux and there's all kinds of really great developers working on that platform so it was a really nifty thing. It's not really maybe a console in the traditional sense. Maybe as a traditional console favorite would probably have to be the Nintendo 64 just because I spent so much time on it. Close second will be the Sega Dreamcast. I guess if I were writing the definition for virtual reality it would be something along the lines of a technology that allows you to put yourself in a synthetic environment and have it be indistinguishable as much as possible from real life. At least for me and a lot of other people, video games are about escapism. I mean, you know, there's other reasons. It's fun to play multiplayer games. It's fun to, you know, have social games. But a lot of those big single player titles like Fallout 3, you're not going in there to, you know, get a lot of points. You're going in there to have an experience, to get away into another world and experience it if, as if you're someone else. I think that virtual reality really brings that to the end game of where video games have been trying to get, which is being another person in another place and not having to worry about the world around you. So imagine that this is a pair of ski goggles right here. You put it on and you can actually see through these ski goggles. But what you see isn't the real world. What you're seeing is a virtual world, the inside of a video game. You're able to look around, you look up, it displays the up image. Over here, the right image, and it smoothly pans across that. So no matter where you look, it still feels like you're inside of the game. That's what virtual reality can do. I didn't actually start out to create a virtual reality headset. I set out to buy a really nice one. So I tried buying one and it didn't really work. I bought a few consumer units and then I started scouring government auctions and liquidation companies and eBay and buying all manner of different head mounts and none of them was really what I wanted for playing video games immersively. And so I said, oh shoot, well it looks like I'm going to have to actually try to make my own. And I actually found that it was something that there was a lot of technology that advanced over the last few years and it was actually something that was finally possible to do. You know, a lot of the challenges haven't even been on my part or Oculus's part. They've been on the part of markets that are being driven by other forces, like display panels have been getting higher density, lower cost, and lighter weight thanks to mobile phones. Motion gaming plus all, you know, all these mobile devices have made motion sensors also very cheap. So I have to say that the greatest difficulties haven't been things that we've overcome. They've just been things that technology's overcome by getting better and better and better over the years. So one of my biggest hopes for the Rift is that it can really deliver an immersive gaming experience for every gamer. I mean, the whole point of first-person shooters and a lot of other genres too has been to basically try to simulate being inside of the game, to simulate being the person that you're playing as. So I think virtual reality, it can really take you there and if everyone could experience it, that it would be great. One of my greatest fears is that virtual reality has this stigma against it already. A lot of people just dismiss it you know, without even reading the facts. They have a right to be skeptical. Virtual reality has been hyped in the past and it hasn't delivered. The Oculus Rift is the first headset that I think actually delivers at a price point that people can afford.
so there's a few paths to truly immersive VR. What we have right now, it's really cool, but I mean, it's pretty hacky. It's a display and you can do motion controls, but that's not something that's actually gonna trick people into thinking they're inside of a game. As time moves on, we're gonna get more and more advanced. And there's probably two paths that this can go. One of them is gonna be direct brain links. And unfortunately, I'm not a physician, so I have no idea how probable that is. The people I've talked to aren't very optimistic. The other path that there is, there's just so many technologies you can do in hardware. Like, I think that one of the big revolutions in gaming over the next few years is going to be advanced haptics technology that can give you a decent sensation of touch. Um, another one is galvanic vestibular stimulation. You can actually use electrical current to stimulate your inner ear and simulate movement and rotation through a space. That's something that's going to make a big difference in the game space. And I could see within 10 or 20 years having full haptic suits that are able to really simulate the feeling of being in a synthetic environment. I think movies are going to be a really interesting thing, either rendering it as if you're in a virtual movie theater or perhaps actually using full 360 degree capture cameras so that you can actually feel like you're inside of the scene and turn and be able to see the action that's not just going on in front of you, but what's going on behind you, what's going on over there. I think that'll be really fascinating. I think one of the best, worst virtual reality movies of all time is Lawnmower Man. I mean, it just put it at this ridiculous level. Why are the people in spinning gyros? Why are the head mounts designed the way they are? Why exactly do you have to go into a virtual system to fix physical problems? But, you know, it was a really interesting movie and people got this idea from it that you could really actually feel like you were flying around inside of this game fully immersed and that isn't going to pan out for a while. I guess another one would be The Matrix. A lot of people, they're like, so it's like being inside the game. It's like The Matrix. Could someone tell that they're actually inside? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? Yes, it's very apparent with current technology. So it'll be a while till we get to The Matrix, and hopefully people understand that. One of the reasons virtual reality has failed in the past is that the technology really just wasn't ready yet. It's not to say that it couldn't have been ready, it's just virtual reality was not a big enough market to drive the development of ultra high pixel density displays or inexpensive motion trackers. Um, those had to be driven by really mass market things before they could trickle down into these other maybe more niche entertainment divisions. Another problem is that there was no software support. You know, the hardware wasn't that great, so it was hard to impress developers. Developers aren't going to go out of their time to support hardware that isn't really impressive. That's another thing that's changing. Now that the hardware is good enough, you get that second part, which is software. You'll get a lot of software support. And then I guess one of the other big reasons is that virtual reality was so, so overhyped in the 90s to the point where I've read about several things where companies actually did far better as VR companies before they showed anybody their product. Once they actually showed their products to people, people were saying, well, this isn't like Lawnmower Man. And they're like, no, no, this is the same headset that was used in Lawnmower Man. They're like, but in Lawnmower Man, it's cool. And, you know, that was something that really hurt virtual reality. And after enough people had tried it, and I guess you could say the word got out, it kind of went downhill from there. And then you had all these VR companies that were left over. They had to focus on military and research and Fortune 500 companies. They weren't trying to make consumer products. I think one of the differences between, you know, what you would call retro games and modern games is that retro games really had to stand on their own in terms of gameplay. It wasn't like you could have some gigantic boost in graphics that made your game, you know, the best on the market. Nobody was looking at Super Mario Bros. 3 and saying, this game is so great because it has such a, you know, broad palette. I mean, yeah, it did really push the NES hardware, but that's not why it was popular. Whereas today you'll see game marketing where it says, you know, new first person shooter. Sea of Brown and the graphics are amazing, and that's how they sell it. They don't sell it as having brilliant gameplay or a really nifty hook. One really interesting thing that we're seeing in the game industry right now is that a lot of the creative power is shifting away from big giant studios and back to independent developers. Just like, 
you know, it was at the start of gaming, and that's really a fascinating thing, especially for virtual reality. A large game developer might not be able to take big risks on a virtual reality title that only works in VR and really utilizes it. But in indie, they're driven by passion, by wanting to make the best game possible. They're usually not sitting there saying, how can I make something that really gives me a nice return on investment? And I think that that's going to become more and more important in the game space in the coming years. Well, video games are obviously important economically. I mean, they've surpassed the film industry, so nobody can argue that they're not a huge boost to the American economy, especially since, you know, a lot of these American companies are making things that, yes, they have a lot of American jobs, but they're also creating a lot of jobs in other countries, too. Whereas with software, a lot of this stuff is being done, you know, right here in the U.S. So you have American jobs creating American products, selling to an American audience for billions and billions of dollars. How does it get better than that? I think creatively, video games are one of the things that actually inspire youth today. I mean, youth, it's harder for them to go and be inspired by, say, some equation and say, wow, you know, I could be a mathematician or, wow, I really want to become interested in sciences. But when people play video games and they see these fantastical settings, these fantastical characters, and a lot of times these settings are what inspire people. Especially youth don't read books nearly as much these days. The primary form of media for a lot of kids would be TV and video games. You're not going to see nearly as many fantastical sci-fi environments as you do on TV as you do in video games. And I think that inspires a lot of people to say, wow, I really want to be able to make these things, whether it be games or the real life equivalent. One of the things that video games really inspired me to do, I mean, I have like a console modification background and it was always cool to me to be able to say, hey, you know, I can put this game in my Game Boy and then I can actually, you know, switch between crystal oscillators and overclock the speed or up, you know, overclock or underclock the Game Boy. That's something really cool and that got me interested in electronics and I learned a lot from that. And when I started working in VR, it was the same thing, playing these games, being the promise of being able to experience them in the best way. That's what kept me really learning and innovating and innovating and innovating and committing time to this. So some people say that gamers are antisocial or that online communities are antisocial, but the reality is that isolation is relative to the observer. Sure, look in and that's just a guy sitting on his console or on his PC and he's not interacting with anybody. You know, what a loser. But the reality is, I mean, for me, I started an online community and People might say, oh, look at him just sitting there all alone. But the reality is I was having really interesting discussions with literally hundreds of people about creating new technology and engineering and just the world at large. And the crazy thing is a lot of those people have ended up being what you could call my IRL in real life friends. I wouldn't have met these people without these online communities. You just don't meet people with interests that match yours so closely unless you can have these digital systems that can group people together like you all in one place. I think virtual reality has an interesting aspect to it in that, sure, I can talk to these people online or I can chat with my friends on Xbox Live, but people really like sharing space. That's what parties are. I mean, people don't do anything at parties. They go there and they all stand in a space, and that sounds lame in a way, but for some reason our brains really like sharing space with other people. And it creates a different kind of social experience than sitting on the phone or IMing. I think that virtual reality can take these online communities, these gaming communities, and bring in that aspect of actually sharing space with all these people. That's not to say it can replace it, but I think that it'll certainly augment it pretty well. So it's not even just escapism, escaping into different places. How we perceive ourselves virtually can very much change how we perceive ourselves as a person innately. There have been studies where people have been measured on confidence tasks when they're rendered at their normal height in virtual reality, and then when their height is boosted up even just a few inches. And the interesting thing is they do better on these confidence tests just having their height boosted, measured and reliably. And those effects actually last even after they come out of virtual reality, you know, for at least a little bit. And I think that that's really fascinating, that people really tie so closely their inner selves to their virtual selves, and that virtual reality can really bring that to life. It'll be really amazing to see what happens when a person can say, I want my virtual representation of me to be exactly who I want it to be. You've seen some of that with Second Life and other online communities where people can create avatars. But again, 
controlling something on a screen with a mouse and keyboard is just not the same as actually being able to look at yourself in VR and say, wow, I really am this completely different person that is exactly who I want to be in my mind's eye. What I love about video games is that they let you experience things that you would never be able to experience in real life. I'm probably never going to be a Jedi Knight or a fighter pilot or a time traveling silent hero, but that's something I can do in a video game. I can experience these things that are so far beyond what's available to us in real life. And that's what excites me about virtual reality. It's actually being able to experience those things instead of just controlling a representation of it on a screen.